Chapter Sixteen of the Ghost Girl by Henry Kitchell Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen The Housebreakers. We were standing on what felt like the roadway, Jeffrey and I. A mile down the road, we could just distinguish the purr of Jack's limousine i used the last glimpse of its headlight as it swung around in the road for a look at my watch it was a quarter to two in the morning we remained where we were without moving a muscle until it was out of hearing hearing and touch were the only senses that gave us any contact with reality at all for the night was completely dark the sky must have been very thickly overcast for there wasn't light enough overhead to show the profile of the treetops it was still too there wasn't a breath of wind and there were none of the country noises that ordinarily fill the ear at night we were as nearly as geoffrey had been able to guess half a mile from the main entrance to beech hill estate Jeffrey laid a hand on my arm. This way, he whispered. What sense of direction it was that enabled him to keep the road, I don't know. Perhaps he could feel the ruts with his feet accurately enough to give him the direction. Left to myself, I'd have been lost in three minutes. But Jeffrey moved along as confidently as if it had been broad daylight it's perfectly impossible to judge the flight of time under such conditions and i don't know how far we had been walking when he suddenly checked me with a clutch on my arm i could feel him standing as rigid as a setter dog making a point i strained my ears but could hear nothing except the rise and fall of my own breathing what is it i whispered i can't hear anything he didn't answer but i heard him drawing a deep breath through his nose then i realized that he had heard nothing himself it was his sense of smell that had warned him and that realization made me shiver somehow very cautiously he led me over to the right across the ditch and up on the other side where there was a springy soggy turf once there we started forward again but much more slowly and with infinite precaution against noise fifty paces along i got the same warning that had checked geoffrey earlier there was something homelike about it though something that took off the horror of the thing it was the smell of tobacco some one ahead of us there in the dark was smoking a pipe a faint puff of air blew on the left side of our faces and carried off the pipe smoke with it the smoker then was somewhere ahead of us geoffrey's arm signalled me again and once more we moved forward but still more slowly planting each foot with the utmost care moving absolutely without a sound the bank where we were walking seemed to be considerably higher than the road at least we had climbed to get to the top of it and i wasn't conscious of having walked down again the pipe smell grew stronger and presently i heard a sound the deep regular breathing of someone asleep there must be two of them then because the smoker was keeping his pipe lighted i was walking at geoffrey's left that is to say at the side of the bank nearest the road suddenly my left hand touched something and in my surprise i lost my balance a little and my weight came down on it rather heavily it isn't easy to keep your balance walking slowly in the dark did you ever try it the thing gave a little under my weight and yet it resisted stoutly it felt like stretched leather and the surface of it was gritty with dust 
in a second i knew what it was the extended top of a carriage or automobile a stronger whiff of tobacco came up just then and i felt the thing move a little under my hand and heard the faint creak of leather cushions the smoker was in the vehicle there just below me and he had stirred a little possibly the touch of my hand had roused him i had no way of warning jeffrey but apparently he didn't need it there were ten seconds i believe when no bronze statue could have stood stiller than we did then a step at a time we moved on again a little further along we slipped down into the road once more and walked on again a little more freely presently jeffrey stopped took my hand and guided it out past his body until it touched a surface of rough stone the gates he whispered then we walked on rather briskly and with apparently no fear whatever of discovery we're in luck so far said jeffrey i told him of my adventure of the thing my hand had touched there in the dark it was a carriage or an automobile i think said i an automobile said jeffrey couldn't you smell it what's it doing there do you suppose i asked what are the people in it doing watching the place said jeffrey seeing to it that no one goes in or out without their knowing it but who'd be watching and who are they watching for i don't know said jeffrey we shall probably find out before we're through it seems a strange place to set a watch i observed there must be a dozen other ways of getting into and out of this place without going through the main gate there's one other way said jeffrey one other practical way and that's in a boat this place is a peninsula and a very narrow neck and the wall across the neck is much too high to climb without a scaling hook so the gate's a pretty good place to set a watch if there's another watch on the boathouse landing as i suspect there is then the job is pretty well covered i'd like to know then said i a little anxiously how we're going to get away ourselves we got in didn't we said jeffrey and nobody knows we're here that with a little decent luck is handicap enough in our favour somehow the presence of watchers at the gate seemed to have relieved jeffrey of all concern about them now we were inside we walked briskly at a pace i'd never dared have taken in the dark but for the compelling touch of his hand on my arm and if we said nothing it seemed more because jeffrey didn't want to talk than because he was afraid to the drive was perfectly surfaced so there was nothing to stumble on but sometimes we went uphill and sometimes down how jeffrey followed the curves in the drive i couldn't understand at all unless the lateral inclination of the roadway from crown to curve gave clue enough to that wonderful tactile sense of his at last as we reached the top of a little rise a flicker of lightning in the clouds ahead of us silhouetted the house it wasn't more than a hundred yards away jeffrey immediately left the road and struck out to the left the lightning shimmered again and then again more brightly each time and it gave us the general direction of the house as we quartered around it in the arc of a circle but as a guide to what was immediately under our feet flower beds terraces tangles of untouched wilderness jeffrey could have no guide but his memory but suddenly as we rounded the corner of a projecting wing we both stopped short there was a light in one of the second-story windows 
to me that seemed final entering an empty house to say nothing of one whose occupants were all sound asleep seemed a reckless enough proceeding for any one to contemplate in the face of the warning the square of light from that window gave us there seemed nothing to do but count our expedition a dead loss and make the best of our way back to oldborough wait a minute said geoffrey he walked swiftly away toward another building a one-storied concrete affair that had the look of a garage i saw him crouch down on the slope that led up to its great door and explore the surface with his hands then he came back not straight toward me but at an angle toward the corner of the house itself he nodded to me to come along too and when we had reached the place he indicated i saw that we were standing beneath an open window it was some distance from the lighted one give me a leg up he whispered then i can pull you in after me you don't mean i gasped you don't mean to go in with that light there yes i'm going in he said quietly and i warn you it will be dull waiting and mighty interesting inside you had better come along too all right said i i told you i was game and i meant it but i didn't bargain for this there was light enough to see him smile by this is nothing to what we'll be up against before we get through he said come along he put his feet on my bent knee and with a quick cat-like spring was poised on the window ledge then he reached down a strong hand and hauled me up after him there wasn't a tremor in that hand it was as steady as if he had been painting a portrait in his studio illogically enough when we had scrambled over the sill and dropped down lightly inside my first sensation was one of disappointment i had made up my mind to do something thrilling and dangerous committed myself by one decisive action to geoffrey's reckless course and now wanted a run for my money i think you will agree that i got it in the end but just at first the adventure seemed to be flattening out into something very tame we didn't hear a sound our entrance had apparently disturbed no one we were at the end of a bare rather uninteresting looking corridor at the other end of it about forty feet away was the door leading if i had kept my sense of direction straight into the wing where the light was the bright circle from geoffrey's electric torch flashed on that only a second then wheeled to the left and revealed a narrow stairway leading straight up away from us to the floor above halfway down the corridor on the right was an opening which apparently led off at right angles just at the foot of the stairway on the left side of the corridor was a door geoffrey flashed his torch again to the right of where we were standing and revealed another corridor parallel to the one which occurred further down geoffrey didn't keep his light on more than five seconds altogether then seeming to have seen enough to satisfy him he switched it out gave me a hand to guide me and walked straight ahead to the stairway i confess i didn't like going upstairs as long as we had an open window there that could be reached without a rush and tumbled out of without serious risk of injury it wasn't so bad but upstairs it was on the second floor that the light was the stairs were old too and it seemed to me they creaked horribly however we reached the second floor without misadventure and found in the momentary glimpse that geoffrey's torch afforded us what seemed to be the same arrangement of corridors as on the floor below the moment geoffrey switched off the torch he directed my attention to a thin thread of light that was coming out from under the door at the end of the corridor 
he gave a little grunt of satisfaction but to my relief immediately led me away from it back along the corridor to the point above the window where we had got in and then off to the left at the end of ten paces he stopped me in front of a door a flicker of lightning outside revealed that much it also revealed that geoffrey had his ear against the door panel we stood there perfectly still for what seemed a long time to me probably not more than twenty seconds then perfectly calm geoffrey opened the door and went in it was a big rather nobly proportioned room with a fireplace in it and a bow window at one end charmingly and rather intimately furnished but with an air somehow of disuse i got that general impression from a prolonged series of lightning flickers meanwhile geoffrey's bull's-eye was picking out details what it seemed to rest on longest was a heavy layer of dust on the bare mahogany centre table and on the mantel over the fireplace there were two doors beside the one we had come in by but the one he finally advanced to was in the opposite wall he opened it without hesitation this time and we found ourselves in a long deep clothes closet the two side walls showed nothing but bare hooks but the short wall at the end had a few nondescript articles hanging on it i'd have turned away without a second glance but geoffrey went straight in and i saw him apparently scrutinizing the garment hanging at the far end at close range with his electric torch there wasn't room for both of us in there and i had no idea what he could find to interest him so i waited in the bow window the lightning was now almost continuous and there was an occasional mutter of thunder along with it the storm which the dead stillness of an hour ago had prophesied was getting near enough to be reckoned with and on the whole i wasn't sorry anything would be better than that breathless silence out of doors what small comfort i got out of that was presently neutralized though by what i saw out on the lawn in the instantaneous illumination of a vivid lightning flash just a silhouette of a man crouching tense behind the trunk of a big tree he wasn't watching the house he was turned in the other direction there were many watchers abroad to-night and some of the watchers were watched the glimpse of that crouching figure gave me a bad moment of panic but geoffrey's voice just then put me back on my feet come along drew he said we're getting warm the flash of his torch showed me the way into the closet geoffrey crowded back against the side wall to let me pass and then i saw behind the garments that hung from the hooks screening it like a curtain was a low narrow door opening back go in said geoffrey it's all right it took me a moment to see where we were then i made out a long passage of level flooring on the right leading in a curve around a swelling dome of lath and plaster that looked like an enormous tomb that's the vaulting to the ceiling of the room below said geoffrey i suppose it's the dining-room better let me lead i guess he was excited and triumphant not so much i thought over finding the secret doorway at the bottom of the closet but by what the tracks on the floor and the little chips of plaster seemed to be telling him we circled half-way round the dome when he stopped short and confidently opened another door i heard him give a little gasp when he got inside and squeezed through quickly beside him he closed the door behind him 
it was an extraordinary room not more than seven feet wide and fully thirty long so that i should have thought of it as a corridor had not the furniture ranged in a row along one of the walls declared plainly enough that someone had lived there there was a narrow bed a dressing-table a chiffonier and further along than that a row of bare hooks screwed into the wall at uneven intervals an exclamation from geoffrey attracted my attention to the lighting arrangements there were no regular electric fittings but from a hole in the ceiling an electric wire hung down a little beyond the dressing-table and on the end of it was a double socket with two big tungsten lamps they wanted light up here and plenty of it said geoffrey but where are the windows i exclaimed there were no windows inside there was a long narrow skylight and the carpentry of it was as rough and slovenly as that which had put up the clothes hooks and dangled that unprotected electric cord through a hole in the ceiling geoffrey sat down on the low chair in front of the dressing-table laid down his electric bull's-eye and pulled open the one shallow drawer what he found there struck me as trivial enough but it seemed to interest him mightily a well-used powder-puff and a box of rice powder a girl would have to be a pretty decided blonde drew he observed to put on powder of that colour and not have it show geoffrey said i quickly let's get out of here i can't stand this room i don't know why but there's something sinister about it he looked around from the table and nodded at me soberly it is sinister he assented it's ghastly but we're not through yet what is it i demanded what is it that i feel in here i haven't any extra sense for things in the first place said geoffrey it's a concealed room that accounts for the shape of it that accounts for the skylight and it's a concealed room that's been used drew somebody lived here a good long while unknown to the servants unknown i imagine to the mistress of the house herself someone has lived here and if i am not mistaken he hesitated a second and then let me have the full value of the words if i am not mistaken died here drew he got up with a little shiver from the dressing-table carrying the bull's eye with him and walked to the other end of the room the end we had not come in by under the strong rays of light even i could see from where i stood that there was another door there though there was no latch nor frame just a frayed soiled outline upon the wallpaper geoffrey turned round and leaned back against it his face wearing a puzzled thoughtful frown his eyes were fixed all the time on the dressing-table and the wall behind it then his gaze went up to the electric wire nothing's quite right in this room drew he said why isn't that dressing mirror under the light where it would shine on both sides of the face come let's put things tidy catch hold already he was at one end of the dressing-table i took the other and we lifted it carefully along to its proper position just under the electric light ah said geoffrey in a flash he had out his knife and was digging away at a small hole in the plaster behind where the mirror had been i watched him in silence his look was triumphant enough now in another minute he had dug something out of the joist in the wall and was holding it out in his palm to me 
it was a small slightly flattened revolver bullet geoffrey i gasped do you work miracles how long did you know that was there look at the chip broken off the corner of the mare said geoffrey the bullet did that you can see the shape of it the bullet must have gone somewhere if the shot had been fired from the other direction it would have gone on and smashed the mare if it had been fired by a person who had just come in by that door where i was standing and aimed at a person sitting on that stool before the dressing-table it must have gone into the wall there's nothing difficult about that but true let me see that bullet again i handed it back to him he looked at it now with an incredulous frown and then to my amazement clenched his hands with a gesture of absolute perplexity always the contradiction he said always the one contradiction i thought i had it but i'm wrong again drew i'm going to see this thing through if it takes the rest of my life i'm going to find out what really happened in this house on the night of the nineteenth of december but geoffrey i expostulated what more could you want what more could you hope for than what you've got already that bullet he said it isn't the right caliber drew then suddenly he switched off his light and clutched my arm tightly listen he said for a breathless moment of silence there was nothing then there came to my ears what he had heard before distant muffled as if from a long way off the sound of running feet the footsteps were those of a man a heavy man the sound of them grew louder and then fainter again the man had run down one of the corridors fleeing in terror from something the footsteps stopped abruptly then almost instantly went on again running but now they were growing louder he's coming back i whispered he's lost said geoffrey he's lost his way and then with a sudden sweep of his arm he caught me and crowded me back against the wall the fugitive was coming straight toward the hidden chamber was the pursuer coming too a long flicker of lightning whitened the skylight and gave me a glimpse of geoffrey's face tense the eyes blazing with expectancy then came the dark once more but only for a moment the door at the far end of the room burst open as if someone had run blindly into it and at that moment a great crevice of white flame opened in the sky and for nearly a second the room blazed with light the man at the door staggered in his face whiter than the mass of bandages wrapped around his neck his eyes staring in maniacal terror but what fixed my own horrid stare more than the terror in the man's eyes was a sudden red stain that i saw come through the bandages the outcry he gave was swallowed in the crash of thunder that followed the lightning flash then in the blacker dark that swallowed him up we heard his limp body thud upon the floor the door behind creaked on its hinges such was the fugitive what had been the pursuer End of chapter 16。Jeffrey was moving in the dark, and in a moment I heard the door pulled shut again. It's all right, 
he said quietly but apparently it's up to us to get the poor chap out of here who do you mean i whispered barton said jeffrey didn't you recognize him he flashed on his torch and i stared at the inert man on the floor he did look pretty wild he went on i don't know that i'd have spotted him myself if it hadn't been for the bandages then i have expected we might find him here we were both bending over the prostrate man now he was unconscious white as death and with the growing smudge of red on the bandages ghastly it's the wound his wife gave him said jeffrey he's broken it open again and i don't wonder it wasn't a very serious hemorrhage though the smudge wasn't growing very fast and the man must have a lot of vitality already he was showing signs of coming back to consciousness what was it that frightened him jeffrey i asked what was it he was running away from do you know spooks like enough said jeffrey easily they'll hardly trouble us but what's really after him may prove a handful for us we've got to get him out of here drew he can tell us more about what happened in this house that other night than i supposed he could when we came here and if richards once gets his hands on him we'll never know what it is he has to tell we've got to get him out of here and into that hotel room at oldborough and the sooner we get about it the better wait a minute he pulled a small silver flask out of his pocket and handed it to me give him a little of that he said he went away to the other end of the room apparently to get a pillow that lay on the stripped bed he didn't come back for a minute and i hadn't leisure to observe just what he was doing for with the first drop of brandy that passed his lips barton's eyelids trembled then opened a little and i found him looking at me with an unseeing stare it was her face he said did she follow you too then rousing a little more he frowned at me as though i were not whom he thought where am i he whispered and who are you you're all right jeffrey whispered coming up with the pillow we're friends we're going to get you out of here then i am here he said with a shudder in the beach hill house said jeffrey oh yes but you won't be long we're friends i tell you you've nothing to worry about drink some more of the brandy and then we'll see if you can go on your own pins there was another flare of lightning and a crash of thunder and this time it was followed by a roar of rain upon the skylight the sound seemed to horrify barton anew to the very verge of panic make it stop i can't stand that noise jeffrey nodded assent to my look of inquiry and each of us taking an arm we raised him to his feet for some reason that i could not understand jeffrey did not avail himself of his torch and we felt our way along in the dark i noticed that the side pocket of barton's coat was bulging with something heavy and i felt more like a burglar than ever i had had leisure to feel since we had got into this room we squeezed through the low door into the closet and then out into the big room with the bow window when we got into the corridor i almost balked for the thread of light still shone through under the door and we had to go almost up to it to reach the head of the stairs they weren't wide enough for three of us to go abreast so jeffrey went ahead and i supporting barton followed to my surprise he didn't go to the open window where we had come in but turned off to the left conducted us down a corridor shot a bolt or two opened the door and let us out into a little brick paved pergola where the rain was now splashing down in torrents it's always easier to get out of a house than into it 
he said falling back abreast of us and taking barton's other arm the roar of the rain drowned the necessity for caution and he spoke as naturally as if we had been sitting in his studio better give him another swallow of the flask drew oh never mind the rain it will do us all good i only hope it doesn't stop barton took a big drink and then without another word we set out as briskly as we dared down the brick paved path confound it said geoffrey presently the rain's slacking up the clouds are breaking too said i and i pointed over to the right where a patch of grey sky appeared behind the black curtain the curtain had a fringe of silver too there'd be a moon before long as a matter of fact under a swift westerly breeze the sky was clearing with alarming rapidity alarming to me at least to my mind that group of watchers at the gate the man who had slept and the man who had smoked his pipe and heaven knew how many more beside were getting more formidable every moment but geoffrey walked on not seeming in the least disturbed although we could now see the roadway plainly enough up to where it was swallowed in the darkness of a grove of trees isn't the gate just beyond there i whispered he nodded then i saw him turn a look of real concern on our capture barton had gone pretty white again and was already turning limp on our hands take one more drink said geoffrey encouragingly and then do exactly what i tell you there's nothing to worry about keep on walking till you get to the trees then turn a little to the right so that you parallel the path to the gate take care to keep tolerably well hidden you don't have to be too careful about it but be sure and get close to the gate then wait there whatever happens until you see the men come in i think they'll all come in at any rate they won't leave more than one and you can deal with him if you have to drew as circumstances seem to dictate but don't look for trouble as soon as the men have come in through the gate you slip out and start straight down the road and don't bother about anything you hear coming behind you he shot another look at barton better now he asked all right without waiting for any answer he crossed the road and soon lost himself to our view in the trees on the other side barton and i walked forward as he had instructed took shelter gladly enough when we could get it and then paralleled the path down to the gate it seemed strange to catch another whiff of tobacco as we pulled up there the man was still smoking it seemed hours years since we had left him there i leaned barton up against a tree just inside the gate and settled myself to await developments they weren't long coming it couldn't have been two minutes after we had taken our position when i heard a cry of alarm a shout a revolver shot the sound of someone running plunging heavily through the underbrush and then the shrill scream of a policeman's whistle or what sounded like it the effect on the watchers outside was as might be expected instantaneous they came tumbling through the gate three of them running in the dazed manner of men just startled by a sudden alarm i remember seeing the smoker putting his pipe in his pocket with one hand while he tugged at a revolver with the other without geoffrey's explicit instructions i should have left barton to take his chance and tried to go to my friend's assistance for the terror of the outcry the revolver shot and the sound of that heavy body plunging blundering among the trees were all very realistic and not less ominous but previous experience had taught me that it wasn't easy to improve on his instructions so i obeyed them literally barton and i were out in the road in no time at all and making the best time his condition would allow away from beech hill 
i remember thinking as we trudged along that i could promise myself one thing with a good deal of confidence that was that i'd never go inside those gates again if any one had prophesied that i should find myself there once more before the light of another morning i should have called him a lunatic after all though i didn't go in through the gates we tramped along in a glum silence what barton's thoughts might be i didn't know he seemed to be moving by a dogged effort of will at every step for myself i was worried about jeffrey but suddenly even the thought of him was swallowed up in the alarming realization that behind us on the road was an approaching automobile it was coming along pretty fast too i had begun looking around in the moonlit brightness for something that would serve for cover to hide in until it should go by when i remembered the last thing jeffrey had said don't mind anything you hear coming from behind so though it seemed like courting immediate capture i gripped barton's arm a little more firmly and we plodded doggedly on the car came rapidly nearer then as it got to a position where its driver must have been able to see us i heard it slowing down of course we had given it ample room to pass and the sudden checking of its speed was so ominous that if it hadn't been too late i'd have tried for a bolt even then the clutch was out as it came alongside creaking in the dark and then i got another surprise the sound of jeffrey's chuckle from the driver's seat all right he said tumble in and i'll take you into oldborough in no time but barton stood stock still in the road i don't know who you are he said nor what you're trying to do i don't know what you've been doing nor i don't care but i'm not going to make any getaway i have had enough if you want to take me to the police station in oldborough all right if you don't why go your ways and leave me here i don't know yet said geoffrey soberly exactly what it is you've got on your conscience i've no idea of helping you to escape from the penalty of it but if you do what you just said go now and give yourself up there's a worse man than you who'll get off you've got a queer story to tell the police won't believe it but we will and we want you to tell it to us first he's a devil barton don't play straight into his hand jump in without another word barton obeyed and dropped back with a sigh of exhaustion against the cushions in the tonneau i was about to follow him when geoffrey beckoned me to take the front seat beside him i suppose said i as we started on again that this is the car the men were watching in don't you think you've got us in pretty deep by taking it i don't see that said geoffrey according to the stenciling on the inside of the top it's the property of wellgood's garage in oldborough i found it abandoned on the road and i'm taking it back i'll give them my own name and tell them that they can find me up till tomorrow morning at the hotel incidentally i may find out who hired the car not that i haven't a pretty good guess already we'll stop first at the main entrance of the hotel you can take barton in the front door find out the number of jack's rooms from the register and take him there gwendolen's idea of the towel hanging out of the window was interesting but perhaps a little theatrical and besides i don't believe barton could get in through another window to-night to save his life get him into bed and give him some more brandy i'll be back from the garage in ten minutes forget that we're housebreakers drew nobody knows it but ourselves geoffrey often gave advice that looked pretty hard to follow though the difficulties in the way of it often vanished miraculously when one walked straight up to them this case was no exception until i met the eye of the sleepy clerk in the little old borough hotel i felt as if i had burglar written all over me in letters no one could fail to read as for barton i thought when i got a look at him that he was enough to discredit the respectability of mr carnegie 
but when i walked boldly up to the register and the clerk instead of ringing the fire alarm and shouting for the police had offered me a worn pen dipped in gummy ink to register with my career of crime dropped off me like a cloak and i was my own man again i told the clerk it would be necessary to call mr marshall and that i believed he had engaged an extra room for my companion and myself he did look a bit queerly at barton for a minute but he made no trouble about doing as i asked jack opened the door of the unoccupied room in answer to my knock just in time to catch barton as he toppled and fell in a second faint he recovered consciousness rather quickly after we had laid him on the bed but it was evident that the man was not far from the end of his physical resources we were debating gwendolen had slipped on jack's automobile coat and joined the conference whether it would be safe to let him go till morning without sending for a doctor when geoffrey came back i was right in my guess as to hired the automobile he said it was richards i left word that if he wanted any explanation of the disappearance of the car he could come here and i imagine he'll turn up within an hour or two he went over and sat down beside barton on the bed you know who richards is don't you the man nodded indifferently when richards comes geoffrey went on the affair will be taken out of our hands but if you'll tell us the truth now we'll be able to help you i'm past help said barton it doesn't matter what happens to me now it matters to other people though said geoffrey you aren't the only one who's fallen into crow's clutches at the mention of crow's name an extraordinary change came over barton spots of bright colour appeared in his cheeks and he breathed quickly for a minute like a man who has been running you said crow was a devil he said and you're right it's no use trying to prove anything on him that's what i tried to do but it was no good let him alone or he'll get you where he got me he and he stopped short and his eyes widened as if once more he saw a ghostly face in front of him and his own turned the colour of the dingy sheets we've got him barton said geoffrey quietly all we need is your help tell us the story barton stared at him a moment with a feverish look of hope then with a sigh sank back against the pillow it's no use he said you wouldn't believe it i can tell you part of it now said geoffrey shall i your wife has told us part of the story already how the woman you know as irene fournier came to your house and rented a room there how she began giving you tips about your clients how she told you about miss meredith and how miss meredith came it was after miss meredith's first visit wasn't it that crow came and saw irene you found out about that somehow though irene didn't mean you to she gave you some sort of explanation of crow's visit and of his identity that prevented you from suspecting anything then but afterwards when she disappeared you thought of crow and tracked him as a means of finding her it was nothing but a business proposition to you was it miss meredith was too good game to let go so easily no said barton that wasn't it crow's a devil right enough but that woman was a witch i knew from the first that she was playing with me using me i knew every time she let her hands touch me that it was only to turn me into a puppet to do her bidding and dance when she pulled the string geoffrey looked at him incredulously he frowned and shrank a little away from barton so that was in it too was it he asked in a changed voice that was all there was in it what did i care about miss meredith and her money 
we were doing a good business we didn't want to blackmail anybody but irene i tell you i wanted her i knew i'd never have her i knew she despised me and laughed at me she hadn't the heart of a panther and yet when she wanted to when she looked at me with those big blue innocent eyes of hers she could make me believe anything she said she used to tell me stories about when she was a child the games they used to play and the work in the fields she said her folks were peasants and she'd tell me how they used to make the cider in the fall that was in france said geoffrey barton nodded she dressed up once for me in peasant's dress and she looked like an angel i tell you what part of france asked geoffrey normandy she said oh it was all lies i suppose she'd got the costume for some fancy ball but when she told me with that soft appealing sort of look about how she'd never had any mother and how she'd been brought up by an aunt she hated and who hated her and had never had any love or kindness oh she drove me crazy then said geoffrey when you found out where she was and went to beech hill it wasn't because miss meredith was there but why did irene go to beech hill was it miss meredith with her or was it dr crow both i think miss meredith first and the money that was the big thing but the other was in it that's why at last he broke off again panting you went to be chill said geoffrey and you found irene there how did you do that she was hidden barton's eyes widened in a frightened stare how did you know that he demanded she was hidden in the room where he found you tonight crow knew she was there of course did miss meredith know or anyone else miss meredith saw her said barton slowly and breathlessly but she didn't know she was there saw her i echoed but didn't know she was there yes yes said geoffrey that's what he means that's it he glanced at barton expecting him to go on but his eyes had dropped shut and his breathing was pretty faint take a few minutes to rest said geoffrey there's lots of time then he turned on gwendolen jack and me don't you see he said aren't you beginning to get the pattern now most of crow's story was true the old lady had come back with the delusion that she had killed her niece crow found the photograph and explained the delusion but he couldn't be sure the girl was dead he never had any valid assurance or he wouldn't have been so keen to find out whether i mightn't have seen her in paris but he did a clever thing substituting the photograph he must have thought then that he had all the cards in his hands exactly how the discovery came to him that he hadn't i don't know it's possible that the girl made a first attempt at recovering her own name and position and her rightful share mind you it was rightfully hers of her aunt's property by some perfectly direct and honest course she may have written to miss meredith may have attempted to see her only to find all those attempts frustrated by crow's watchfulness that's pure guesswork but then she hung out the lure we know about and it worked she got miss meredith to come to the bartons just once and once was enough that brought crow to his knees he found her and made a bargain with her perhaps barton's story will help us conjecture what the terms of that bargain were certainly there was a good basis for bargaining because there was enough for both of them anyway she was to come to beech hill not as a living person but as a ghost 
she was to haunt that old woman probably direct her actions with all the authority that visitors from the spirit world are supposed to possess and she was to play into crow's hands the only thing i don't understand is how she quite dared to bargain with crow she knew he was dangerous she dared anything said barton faintly and she was clever enough too you're right about what she did but i don't see how you could find it out how did you find it out said geoffrey that's what i am curious about i'll tell you what happened he said i can go on now it was two or three minutes though before he did go on and when he began to speak again he seemed to be hesitating not like one who is inventing but like a witness very careful for the truth i traced her to oldborough he said and made sure she had gone to beech hill i heard about the place from town's people how remote and lonely it was and of course that i knew would make it harder for me to get a chance to see her and talk to her but it seemed they had great trouble keeping servants i am an experienced indoor servant myself it was what i found out about smart people from being a butler that started me in the spiritualist business so that seemed to be my chance there were people who said that the old lady was crazy but the general opinion seemed to be that she had her own way when crow wasn't about so i waited until he drove to town one day apparently bound for the city and then i went to beech hill and applied for a position as butler miss meredith hired me seemed mighty glad to get me she told me to serve dinner that night in her sitting-room she wasn't expecting dr crow to come back i'm sure he did come back though just before dinner-time but he didn't see me as i was in the pantry getting miss meredith's dinner ready to serve i heard the car drive up and i supposed it was him come back but i didn't know for sure until i knocked on the door of miss meredith's upstairs sitting-room and then i heard him talking to her she called to me to come in and i came with the dinner he started right out of his chair at the sight of me turned his back toward her and stood staring at me with the most devilish look i ever saw in a man's face he asked me in a low sort of voice who i was and what i was doing there though i think he knew the answer to both questions i didn't say anything and as i expected she answered oh she said he's all right he's the new butler i've engaged well he said i will discharge him now at once and the sooner you pack out of here the better it will be for you then he turned to miss meredith it just happens luckily enough he said that i have seen this fellow before i know who he is i don't care about keeping him she said but i want somebody i'm tired of being so badly waited upon then she turned to me serve my dinner barton she said as quietly as if nothing had happened she was sitting at a centre table out in the room with her back to one of the doors the door was shut i'm sure i turned away to put my tray down on a side table and then turned back ready to lay the cloth i hadn't looked away for more than a few seconds but when i turned back there was irene herself in the room there hadn't been a sound and there wasn't any now until dr crow spoke he wasn't paying any attention to irene any more than if she hadn't been there miss meredith didn't speak to her either just sat perfectly still looking at her in a queer fixed sort of way crow said i believe i'll dine with you here if i may and then he turned to me and said go and attend to it barton i'll serve miss meredith by that time irene had walked around the table and sat down in the chair that crow seemed to have meant to take himself and then i heard miss meredith say in a queer dry sounding voice she's here again she's sitting in that chair 
and she stretched out her arm and pointed at irene in that chair said crow why i'll sit in it myself and show you he moved again toward the chair where irene was sitting saying there's no one here but before he could lay his hand on the chair back miss meredith screamed don't touch her she said don't touch her and crow in a soothing sort of way as though he were just humouring her said all right perhaps she'll go away in a minute of course i saw their game in a minute what they were trying to do with her and why crow was so anxious to get rid of me what i didn't see was why irene should have come in like that when she knew i was there but i caught a look that crow shot at her when he was where miss meredith couldn't see his face and it was perfectly murderous and then i knew she had taken me in on it to give her a hold against crow she was afraid of him the hold worked all right crow came to me as soon as i had gone downstairs he didn't palaver or make any excuse he simply said that it would be as much as my life was worth to try to break up the game and that it would be to my advantage if i played it of course he didn't want me to go now that i had found out what the game was i wasn't afraid of him really and i didn't want the money he offered me but i did want irene i wanted to stay where i could be a protection to her i wanted to see her talk to her i had a sort of hope that perhaps i could get her to leave the place and come away with me although i knew in my heart that that was just part of my folly but i could get no chance to talk to her i saw her nearly every day but it was always the same as that first time she'd appear sometimes in the evening sometimes in broad day generally in miss meredith's sitting-room crow and i would pretend she wasn't there walk around her as if she didn't exist and often the old lady would pretend not to see her too and never say a word irene would come in for a minute and then disappear i didn't like the game but what i liked still less was crow's looks crow crow was beginning to go mad himself just as i had done it got so that he couldn't help looking at irene himself even when he was pretending she wasn't there i could tell by her face too that she knew what was happening to him more than that that she was doing it herself oh i knew her and i finally made up my mind that i'd find her at any risk and put an end to the game one way or another i did find her i'd been watching crow i knew his habits pretty well knew when he was in his rooms in the east wing of the house and when he wasn't finally one day i let myself into his study with a pass-key i spent more than an hour there and i found some queer things among his papers too though i didn't care so much about them then but all at once i heard a sound of someone coming not by the corridor i made for the corridor door and had just got it open but hadn't had enough time to get outside when the door of his boot closet opened and crow stepped out it was a tiny little closet and i was sure he hadn't been there all the time i was in his room besides i heard him coming so i thought i knew the way to find irene i made some excuse to crow about miss meredith having told me to find him and about his door being unlocked i knew he didn't believe it but i didn't care he didn't seem to care much either about my trespassing for he started out to find miss meredith i pretended to go away too but i was back in ten seconds and into his room and into the boot closet and there i found a passage that ended at last in the room where irene was we had to give him another few minutes rest after that i didn't wonder at the horror i had seen in his face if he could remember things like that whose mere recital made my blood run cold finally geoffrey prompted him you found her in the long room she wasn't dressed 
at least not completely she was sitting on the low stool in front of her dressing-table looking into her mirror it was a stormy night and there was a roar of rain on the skylight that kept her from hearing you we were all staring at him and i think all our hearts stopped beating for a second when barton with a thoughtful nod said simply yes it was like that how was she dressed exactly geoffrey asked when i came in she was all dressed except the gown the white satin gown yes that's what she always wore when she appeared to miss meredith she was getting ready for another appearance then yes how could you be sure if she hadn't on the gown she had her face made up very pale and she was doing her hair the way she always wore it at those times the way it was in the photograph and in the portrait you stood and watched her for a while then what did you do i saw her revolver a little silver mounted revolver lying on the dressing-table beside her i guess she always had it within reach those days she hadn't heard me or seen me yet so i stepped over quickly and picked it up i don't know whether that frightened her or not but she didn't show any sign of it just looked around at me with that queer little smile of hers and said what do you want with that i said i'm not going to hurt you with it and before god i meant that then i said i'm just going to have a little talk with you and i thought we'd leave revolvers out of it i've got one of my own and i pulled it out of my pocket as i said that it was a big automatic what caliber asked geoffrey thirty-eight said barton i laid the two down side by side on the chiffonier and then to have them out of my reach as well as hers i went back to the door she paid no more attention to me than if i hadn't been there went on fixing her hair and began humming a little tune not very loud but not so very soft either in a kind of high carrying voice the rain had stopped as suddenly as it had begun and the sound of that little french tune filled my ears stop it i said and listen to me she stopped good-humouredly enough looked round at me and smiled with her eyebrows up well big silly she asked what do you want to say i want you to quit this game i said i want you to get out of here with me put on your own dress instead of that satin thing and come away without a single farewell appearance she mocked that wouldn't be polite i'll go after that she said once more and i'll be through the game will be played my good barton played and finished to-night something about her mocking smile maddened me it's finished now i said i haven't come here to be made a fool of i've come to take you away and you're coming with me put on your dress still she showed no sign of anger she went on smiling you're very unreasonable she said but you're very big i'll go with you now if you like what does dr crow matter i tell you i suspected her then i knew in my mind she was tricking me and yet i wouldn't believe it she held out her hand to me come here she said i could no more have kept away from her than a bird could keep away from a snake i started over toward her she began humming her tune again somehow that warned me i stood still and listened not to the tune but for something else and i heard it behind me just a faint creak of something i went back all in one jump catching up one of the revolvers off the chiffonier as i did so and i got back to the door just in time to feel it pushing open i put my weight against it and held it she didn't know i had felt the door opening so she kept up the bluff 
you're easily frightened for so big a man she said what did you think i was going to do to you and she took up the tune again somehow that made me see red i knew she'd have let me be killed with no more pity than one might feel for a rat in a trap i know what i'm going to do to you i said and i fired and then all the strength went out of me and i leaned back against the door and watched her she gave a little sob of pain and then slipped down quite slowly from the stool to the floor i'd never seen anyone die before i can see her now as she lay there on the floor her hand over her heart where i'd shot her was there much blood asked geoffrey barton shook his head she had her hand clasped over the wound i tell you she was all white white as marble which hand asked geoffrey which hand was over the wound it seemed a trivial question to ask and barton seemed a little perplexed by it the left he said presently yes the left of course what did you do then geoffrey asked i tried to get out the door behind me but i couldn't open it there was no latch on the inside so i had to go out the other door i had to step over where she lay i don't remember much after that there was a queer curved passage around what looked like a tomb and then rooms the ordinary rooms of the house i don't remember where i went what did you do with your revolver asked geoffrey i don't know which revolver was it you shot her with i don't know i saw red i tell you i didn't know what i was doing i remember meeting one of the servants in a corridor she screamed at sight of me but i pointed my revolver at her and told her to be still and then somehow i found myself outdoors out in the dark and i began running then there was a crash and everything went out i suppose i must have run into a tree i don't know how long i lay unconscious the next thing i know i was back in that room that horrible room it was daylight and the house was quite still there was a terrible throbbing pain in my head i was lying huddled up in a corner of the room on the floor and the first thing i did was to look to see if irene's body was lying there too but it wasn't and then i saw her lying on the bed all dressed in her white satin gown the body laid out quite straight and the hands crossed on the breast i got up and went over to her i couldn't keep away there was a slip of paper lying there between her hands with just a line written on it it said dispose of your work and you won't be followed did you know the handwriting geoffrey asked it wasn't handwriting it had been written on a typewriter somehow in all that narrative of horror that one fact stands out grisliest of all the figure of a man clicking out that message on a typewriter i stayed there all day barton went on without hearing a single sound toward dark i went out and looked about the house it was empty crow miss meredith even the servants were gone there wasn't any question in my mind of what i had to do i must take the body to the river when it had got fully dark i did it did you carry the body all the way asked geoffrey no said barton there was a little two-wheeled truck in the lower corridor that they used for moving trunks about i used that i took her down to the boathouse landing and put her in the water but the current sets in there and i had to get a boat out to get into the channel you know i'd meant to go on across the river and escape from there but i was afraid to leave the boat 
afraid to leave a clue so i went back to the boathouse and put the boat away i skirted the river on foot and waded around the end of the wall and then set out to walk to oldborough it had begun to turn very cold even then and i was nearly frozen when the early train came along and i got aboard i think i must have been delirious before i got off the train i hadn't any intention of going home but by the time we had got back to town i was in a raging fever and didn't know what i was doing the next thing i knew i was in my bedroom in my wife's house you told the story to your wife asked geoffrey but barton shook his head she never asked i think she suspected when she found me painting out irene's picture she suspected before that said geoffrey she found irene's revolver in your pocket i wanted to tell her said barton but somehow i couldn't we never talked about it at all until the day we tried to give the seance i didn't know she had the revolver that day until i saw it in her hand then i tried to get it away from her i really don't know anything that has happened since then as soon as i got away from that house i started up here i thought maybe i could get the goods on crow i don't know anything about my wife where she is or what she's doing i tried to call her up on the phone one day but didn't get any answer no said geoffrey you couldn't get any answer she was arrested the day of the seance for the murder of irene fournier she confessed that she did it barton sat up straight and then tried to get up off the bed they shan't keep her another day he said she had nothing to do with it she confessed to save me yes said geoffrey that's what she did she thought you had done it just as you do but barton you didn't kill irene fournier any more than she did End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the ghost girl by henry kitchell webster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter 18 a question of centimeters barton tried impatiently to shake off his hands it's no use talking to me like that i've been out of my head once or twice to-night but i'm not now i've told you the truth every word of it literal truth i know you have said geoffrey i could check up most of it but you didn't kill the woman you know as irene fournier your wife thinks you did and she confessed to save you miss meredith thinks she killed her killed claire meredith that is who i believe to be the same person and you you think that you killed her but you're all wrong what are you talking about said barton didn't i fire a revolver at her didn't i see her die under my eyes you were standing with your back against the door said geoffrey when you fired at her she was sitting in front of the dressing-table on a low stool her right side was toward you wasn't it she hadn't moved hadn't turned toward you when you fired barton shook his head dumbly you fired only once barton nodded your bullet said geoffrey carried away a corner of the mirror support and buried itself in the plaster of the wall irene's revolver wouldn't have had penetration enough to do that if the bullet hadn't entered her body first and sitting where she was she couldn't have intercepted it how do you know that was the revolver i fired said barton because you carried it away with you said geoffrey you had it in your hand when you frightened the servant in the hall and it was in your pocket when your wife found it besides if you'd shot her with an automatic thirty eight the bullet would have left its marks somewhere else geoffrey gave that a minute to sink in and then he went on again why was it that irene appeared that first night when you were in the room 
you know the reason she was afraid of crow she wanted a hold on crow that your knowledge of the game would give her she wanted two people to play off against each other and you and crow served her purpose she couldn't have feared crow without reason and she wouldn't have taken you into the game unless she had feared him but in spite of her fear she played the game recklessly evidently she thought that night that she had it in her own hands otherwise she wouldn't have tried to trap you when you fired at her you missed she was quick-witted enough to do the one thing that would keep you from firing again pretend that she was hit the fact that she was already made up white to look like a ghost made the trick easier to play but she might have played it better she acted like an opera tenor made the conventional gesture clapped her left hand to her breast in spite of the fact that it was her right side that was exposed to you but the trick worked you weren't in a condition to think about details you couldn't get out the door you had come in by because crow was holding it on the other side now what happened after you had gone out crow came in you had played straight into his hands he must have wanted desperately to get her out of the way when would he have a better opportunity to do it than just after you left thinking you had killed her yourself your revolver was lying on the chiffonier but i don't think he noticed it if he had he'd probably have killed her with it instead of with his own how do you know he didn't kill her with it i asked assuming that you are right about everything else how can you be sure of that why said geoffrey i have taken the trouble to read the full report of the inquest a thing that even barton has neglected to do the bullet was found in the body and it was a thirty-four he turned back to barton i suppose you'd had enough of the crime without reading about it he said i dare say i'd have felt that way myself but if anything is true in the world barton it's that the man who killed irene fournier was the man who followed you up that passage intending to kill you and if that man was crow then crow was the murderer there was a silence after that gwendolen broke it he must have killed her without giving her time to finish dressing because the bodice itself wasn't penetrated by the bullet he must have dressed her himself afterward why do you suppose he did that i imagine said geoffrey that for some reason a good deal hung on that last appearance irene meant to make she told barton here you remember that the game would be played that night finished she probably meant to play it her way refused to play it crows somehow or other i imagine that her body dead and cold and white clad in its satin gown was used once more to terrorize crow's victim and then this is pure guesswork you know after he had carried her back and laid her on the bed in the hidden room waiting for the dark of another night to finish his work and hide the traces of it he started out for a walk perhaps just at dawn and he found barton there unconscious how he got him into the house i don't know he's strong enough i think to have carried him in bodily or whether he roused him and walked in and then drugged him into a deeper unconsciousness afterward i don't know however he did it that one discovery gave him his chance whatever happened he would be fortified by the irresistible presumption in barton's mind that barton himself was the murderer i can hardly believe it yet said barton i can see her still just as she looked there on the floor she looked like death and why he stopped there and seemed to be wrestling with a question he found it hard to ask finally he got it out if i didn't kill her then what has she got against me now why did she appear to me to-night in the house there was something in the simple almost childlike way in which he asked the question that embarrassed us a little me anyway and i think geoffrey too for he changed the subject rather abruptly why did you go back there barton you said you wanted to get the goods on crow i don't know just what i wanted he said 
i knew he had some papers that he kept locked up pretty carefully in a steel uniform case i took a wax impression of the lock the last day i was there i didn't know what he had but i felt pretty sure there was something i made the key at home when i hadn't anything better to do i made sure there was no one in the house tonight miss meredith and her companion had gone back i found that out at oldborough and they said crow hadn't been down for some time i knew the caretaker slept in the gardener's cottage so i thought it a good chance to go and see what my key would unlock well you're rather a reckless burglar i think said geoffrey lighting up crow's wing of the house under those conditions i didn't said barton i used a pocket torch weren't you rather startled asked geoffrey when you heard the automobile driving in i didn't said barton an automobile passed me on the way out to beech hill none came into the grounds while i was there i could see from geoffrey's face that he was puzzled and the quality of his voice showed it too when he asked the next question what did you do tell us exactly what you did forced a window on the first floor and got in said barton went down the corridor and let myself into the east wing of the house that was crow's and he always kept it locked i found his box and went to work my key needed a bit of retouching before i could get it open on top of the things in the box was a photographic plate wrapped up in paper i shone my torch through it and it looked like a photograph of irene i didn't want that so i put it aside and began picking at the papers a photographic plate said geoffrey not a photograph no a plate i let my torch shine through it she was dressed in white satin like in the portrait what did you do with it geoffrey asked i don't know he said i don't know much that happened after that because just then i heard the creak of a door and saw a light and jumped up i thought someone was coming i tell you i was ready for that i shouldn't have made a fool of myself for crow or anyone else i knew just where i meant to go how i meant to get away but then i looked up and saw her his face was white now white as it had been when he came bursting in upon us in the long room where the lightning showed him to us his voice had fallen to a whisper it was irene herself come back she stood there holding a candle shading it from her eyes with her hand but i saw her face staring at me wide-eyed frightened like out of the dark dressed in white asked geoffrey steadily he was the only one of us who could manage his voice like that dressed in white as you had always seen her and with her hair done the same way barton shook his head i don't know i don't think so i didn't see any white just her face and the hand that shaded the candle she made a little noise in her throat and at that i began running i don't know where i went i got lost in the passages and when the lightning showed where i was i was in the room where i had killed her there was another silence broken at last by geoffrey and the strangeness of what he said fairly made me gasp a photographic plate he said thoughtfully his narrowed eyes were looking out at nothing in the intensity of his concentration to barton's terrifying vision he wasn't apparently giving a thought i'd like to see that i wish you had it here at that moment there came a thundering knock at the door and without waiting for an invitation to enter richards burst in upon us the open door hid the bed and for a moment he didn't see barton but the sight of geoffrey seemed to be enough to finish him well he said grimly you aren't the man i'm looking for but i guess you'll do you've butted in on the police just once too often and running off with an automobile is no joke put on your coat and come along i'd have got my man if it hadn't been for 
he had got a little farther into the room by then and he caught his first glimpse of the rest of us including gwendolen she was in negligee rather she's very pretty that way and it was the sight of her really that prevented him from noticing barton on the bed for he stopped short and caught his breath and backed up a little excuse me he said oh that's all right said gwendolen we're very glad you've come we are indeed geoffrey corroborated politely as for our butting in you'd never have got your man richards unless perhaps out of the river a couple of weeks from now somebody else would have got him first we saved him for you we're glad you've come to claim him for we didn't know quite what to do with him as he concluded he nodded toward the bed where barton lay richards looked and gasped where did you find him he demanded instead of answering geoffrey spoke to barton jail's the safest place for you until we get through with this business go along with richards keep your head and don't worry i'll let you know how things come out i suppose according to your theory he doesn't even know what he's wanted for said richards the sight of barton had restored his good humour immediately on the contrary geoffrey answered coolly he's been under the impression all along that he had killed irene fournier himself he has told us all about it i've just been trying to convince him that he was mistaken mistaken richards roared and then stood staring speechless i've seen some nuts in my days but you're the prize i've got to hand it to you convince him that he's mistaken he stepped out into the corridor and nodded to two detectives who were waiting there come in he said i've got barton barton seemed to agree with geoffrey that jail would be the best place for him though i doubt if he was much better convinced of his mistake than richards himself he got up stiffly and i picked up his coat to help him into it as i did so i noticed something in one of the side pockets barton said i isn't that the plate he pulled it out and looked at it it was a flat heavy oblong object wrapped in tissue paper i must have put it in my pocket without knowing he said and handed it over to geoffrey here said richards you can't do that send barton along with your men and wait a minute said geoffrey from the quiet authority of his tone he might have been a police commissioner richards hesitated an instant then gave a confirmatory nod to his men barton went out quietly between them well demanded richards as i closed the door behind them just a minute geoffrey repeated he tore the paper off the plate and stared at it rather blankly there was claire meredith in her white satin gown posed just as she had been in the portrait that french photographer must have sent him the plate as well as the print i commented i wonder why he did that geoffrey pulled a little steel measuring tape out of his pocket and began very carefully measuring the plate richards shifted his feet uneasily geoffrey's nonsense always worried him but by the look in my friend's face there was no nonsense about this he shut up the tape absently and put it in his pocket then went on staring at the negative he was holding it slantwise now so that the light reflected instead of shining through i shall never forget the expressions that crossed his face doubt at first and then surmise and then a sort of wide-eyed incredulous certainty the rest of us were hardly breathing and at last even richards was gazing at him in involuntary fascination it's not a french plate he said at last more to himself than to the rest of us it measures in inches not in centimetres richards uttered a grunt of disgust is that all you've kept me waiting for what does it matter whether it measures in yards or in courts 
it's not all said geoffrey and his voice rang like a bell it's not all but it's enough it's a photograph of irene isn't it asked richards yes it's a photograph of irene fournier then he caught his breath but we've got to be quick he said he laid down the plate and began struggling into his overcoat you'll come with us he said to richards it was meant for a question but the urgency of it made it sound more like an order where to to beech hill you've got a motor-boat we can go in that it's shorter by river than it is by road what do you want to go there for there's no one there but dr crow and he'll most likely have gone back to bed by this time and how do you know i've got a motor-boat there is some one there besides crow said geoffrey somebody who won't be there very much longer then he turned to jack get out your car as quickly as you can take gwendolen with you drive to beech hill wide open we'll be there ahead of you because the river way is shorter but if through any accident we aren't get into the house don't mind if no one answers make all the row you can and get in it's a life and death case jack richards was still hesitating i don't know why in thunder i should go off on a wild goose chase at half past five in the morning just because a picture of irene fournier measures inches instead of richards said geoffrey did i ever tell you a thing was a fact when it wasn't have i ever started you on a wild goose chase i tell you now that dr crow isn't alone at beech hill or wasn't two hours ago he will be before very long and it's a matter of life and death that we get there first all right said richards come along but i'd like to know how you knew i had a motor-boat End of chapter 18chapter 19 of the ghost girl by henry kitchell webster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter 19 what we saw in the cave outside the hotel we met a leather-clad man who looked something like a chauffeur he touched his flat cap to richards i hope you got the man who stole the automobile lieutenant he said geoffrey laughed surely he got him he said did you ever know the lieutenant to fail back to the boat kelly said richards we've got another job tonight up the river again he's the runner of the police boat the lieutenant explained to me as we went pelting down a steep cobble-paved street in pursuit of geoffrey and the engineer we ran and stumbled and slipped along in the dark for a while without a word but presently richards spoke to me do you know how he knew i had a motor-boat he asked why i panted he knew that barton was at beech hill and that you were watching barton we'd run off with the automobile and i suppose he figured that the only way you could have got back so soon would be in a motor-boat we hadn't been back very long when you turned up and we must have got a pretty good start of you it isn't his running off with a car that makes me sore confided richards though i'll admit i was mad enough when my shore party came down to the river and told me the man i was looking for had gotten away and taken our automobile with him the thing that gets my goat is that geoffrey should have hung out a bluff that i was all wrong in suspecting barton and that the real game was somewhere else altogether and all the while he was tracking barton himself on his own hook just to carry him off under my nose if he'd said i want barton too i'll take my way to find him and you take yours that would have been on the level but i exclaimed geoffrey wasn't and then i stopped short it had been on the tip of my tongue to tell him that our getting hold of barton was the purest accident and that geoffrey had been perfectly sincere in saying he was after other game but the reflection that i was talking to a lieutenant of the police and that a full account of what we were doing 
would have involved a confession that we had committed a crime ourselves that night checked me up rather sharply i had followed jeffrey's advice a little too well in forgetting that i was a housebreaker luckily the darkness and the unevenness of the pavement gave me a plausible excuse for choking off my narrative another minute and we were down on the boat landing in the dim glimmer of the boat's lights i could see that jeffrey and kelly the engineer had already got aboard and cast off jeffrey was holding on to the landing with a boat hook and adjuring us to hurry richards and i stumbled in astern jeffrey seated himself in the bow beside kelly and with a rush and a roar we were off the boat was a long narrow business-like looking craft her four cylinders under the hood up forward and her fine tapering lines and her torpedo stern evidently built for speed it was brighter on the river than it had been in the narrow streets of the town for the dawn was already paling to grey through the clouds over in the east and the surface of the river reflected the colour still more coldly the banks were perfectly black and forbidding we were all warmly clad and we needed the warmth badly in spite of our great coats the chill struck home to all of us perhaps it wasn't only the cold that made us shiver and set our teeth to chattering i couldn't get barton's story out of my head why his story of the apparition he had seen there when he was rummaging amid crow's papers had made so little apparent impression on geoffrey i didn't know i think i am about the last man to believe in ghosts myself but this was the second ghost story i had heard myself in connection with this affair the other you remember was the apparition that had appeared to geoffrey on the bridge in paris and both of them had a terrifying sound of reality to them to get away from that morbid train of thought i forced my mind to attempt a solution to geoffrey's latest enigma what was the enormous significance that he saw in the dimensions of that photographic plate crow had said i remembered that claire had her photograph taken in paris by a french photographer evidently that wasn't true or it wouldn't have been taken on an american plate an american photographer might use a french plate well enough but the other way about never but what did it mean not necessarily that crow had lied he might conceivably have been misinformed puzzle as i might i couldn't get any clue to that wide-eyed look incredulous yet certain that i had seen in geoffrey's face nor to the urgency of the haste with which he had started us back to beech hill the urgency wasn't abated either geoffrey was standing beside the wheel peering out ahead through the thinning dark every line of his tense body a mute appeal to the engineer to drive the boat for all she was worth we were doing pretty well too as the big wave that curled and broke around our bows attested she had a bone in her teeth as the sailors say that trip the beach hill estate as i have said is a peninsula with a blunt broad head and a very narrow neck the general direction of the river is of course southward just above beach hill it narrows between high precipitous banks but below while the east bank holds high and rigid with a rampart of undulating hills the west bank falls away into a hollow the river meets the situation by branching one branch curving around north and even northeast and shading off into a marsh then circling widely southwest and southeast until it joins the main stream again so the large area southwest from beech hill would be a lake if it were not that a low hill rising in the middle of it made an island it was this island and the marsh that forced the road north from oldborough into a wide detour westward that made the river route as geoffrey had pointed out much the shortest 
and if one commanded a high-power motorboat much the quickest way of getting from oldborough to beech hill already the river was widening and presently we made our way through the dark the blunt end of the island hog island i think is the local name of it projecting out into the middle of it jeffrey came aft and joined richards and me of course the nearest way he said is to the right up the main channel if time weren't such a factor i'd take the other the house commands a pretty good view of this channel and what with the daylight and the noise we're making he'll have warning that we're coming a good while before we get there who will have warning said richards crow said geoffrey crow richards exclaimed i thought you wanted to warn crow geoffrey didn't answer that question you saw crow yourself he asked sure said richards what was he doing just what any man would be doing whose house had just been broken into by a burglar he'd got up and dressed and was out looking for him with a gun i met him when i came ashore after i heard the shot fired he didn't seem particularly glad to see me but he acted sore enough when my other men came up and said that the fellow we were after had evidently got away and taken our automobile with him he wasn't very keen on the capture it seems to me said geoffrey he didn't offer you his own car to go back to oldborough in did he you might have caught him with that that little tin pot you rented at the garage couldn't go very fast he probably didn't have any automobile there said richards oh yes he had said geoffrey he certainly had the one he came out from town in last night probably never thought of it said richards no said geoffrey i believe that's true he'd have offered it if he thought of it by the way didn't you offer to leave him one or two of your men to guard the place you couldn't be sure of course that the marauder had got away yes i did said richards but he thought it wouldn't be necessary he said he'd go down and lock the park gates lock the park gates said geoffrey i don't like that that's something i hadn't thought of it's certainly the natural thing to do said richards well he said he and the caretaker would be enough to protect the place and he wouldn't need our help he said to let him know if we got barton did you see the caretaker geoffrey asked richard shook his head come to think of it i didn't it's queer said geoffrey that the noise and the confusion and the shooting didn't rouse him too oh i don't know said richards some people sleep like the dead but it's queer that crow didn't arouse him himself just then kelly called back to us from the wheel there's something wrong with the dope he said we're missing fire right along i hadn't noticed it before but it was obviously true the river was still rushing by fast enough but the current was doing most of that when i sighted a tree on the bank for a landmark i saw that we weren't much more than keeping abreast of it take the wheel a minute said kelly geoffrey was at his side in a minute and began steering the boat out to the left where the current wasn't so swift kelly came aft and opened up the gasoline tank then his face went blank the tank was almost empty i knew we had to fill up again at old burrow he said contritely but i forgot it can't you possibly nurse her along to beach hill landing geoffrey asked kelly shook his head there isn't another half mile in her he said geoffrey threw the wheel over a little farther and we moved still further out to the left we were headed straight for the island now turn around and go back said richards the current will take us back to oldborough all right put drew and me ashore here on the island first i've got a revolver but drew hasn't give him yours then go back to oldborough as best you can and fill up with gasoline when you've got it come back at pelting richards hesitated but geoffrey was still at the wheel and heading straight for the marshy bank of the island 
i haven't time to explain he said i can only give you my word that i'm asking you to do what you would do in a minute if you knew the facts but whether you come back or not drew and i get off here all right said richards i'll come back and he handed me his revolver he had hardly said it when our boat pushed softly into the mud and stopped there was still an uninviting looking stretch of mud and water between us and the hard bank overboard drew said geoffrey and suiting the action to the word he vaulted over the side and started wading in the icy water towards shore i wasn't but a few seconds behind him but i heeded richard's cry and stopped long enough to push the boat out of the mud then i splashed ashore after geoffrey in june when everything is in full leaf i suppose hog island may be an attractive spot in spite of its name any place is beautiful in such conditions but on that cold march morning bleak wet the branches on its stunted trees and undergrowth rattling in the rising wind the dark of its shadows betraying us after the brightness of the river had given a promise of day so that we stumbled in our breathless haste over fallen logs and blundered into mud holes it was about the most dismal place i had ever found myself in geoffrey set the pace and it needed about all my energy to keep up with him if i'm aimed right he said as i came panting alongside we'll come out just opposite the boathouse how are we going to get across i asked swim i suppose said geoffrey i wish there were a quicker way personally i wished there might be a more comfortable way my one plunge thigh deep in the icy water had given me small relish for the prospect of swimming in it but it gave me more than anything that had gone before a realization of how seriously geoffrey meant that our getting to beech hill in time was a matter of life and death geoffrey didn't like to swim any better than a cat it was one of the few athletic sports at which i excelled him matters were urgent indeed when he talked of swimming for the present though we had to climb a long irregular hogback divides the island along its major axis a fact which was probably accountable for its name we were scrambling up now clutching at bushes when the treacherous clay underfoot slipped away beneath us here and there a half embedded rock added to our discomfort we're nearly up commented geoffrey presently and we may see something from the top anyhow we'll find out if our direction's right on hands and knees we gained the crest of the ridge and there paused a moment not for breath badly as we needed it but to give geoffrey a chance to squint through the trees and try to discover if we were headed in the right direction neither of us spoke and now that there was no crackling of branches or rustling of soggy leaves underfoot the silence settled down almost oppressively suddenly i saw geoffrey's body grow tense hold your breath a second drew he said i want to listen for perhaps five seconds neither of us breathed i was listening too with all my ears but i heard nothing presently geoffrey gave a little nod and we started on again not straight down the hill now but at an angle it was easier to keep up with him now for some reason he wasn't setting quite so fast a pace suddenly i stopped dead in my tracks he looked around at me curiously it's nothing i whispered i'm beginning to see things that's all i hate this half-light i thought i saw something moving among the trees geoffrey peered in the direction of my nod perhaps you did he said one of the island's namesakes perhaps rooting around for acorns it didn't look like that i said it didn't look like anything it could be geoffrey i said come along then he said 
neither of us had been paying attention to what was right under our feet and the result was that we both lost our footing on the slippery declivity of the hill and went down with a rush trying to keep from falling but presently i crashed through a dead limb stumbled over a cobblestone and went down in a heap with geoffrey little better off beside me each of us started to say something at the same instant but before we could speak there came a sudden sound that froze us into silence that arrested us half on foot and half on the ground as suddenly as if we had been turned to stone what we heard was a terrified wailing cry in a woman's voice it didn't seem far away seemed right at hand in fact and yet it came from all around came if anywhere from right behind us for a while a space of time that could have been measured in seconds we stared at each other each wondering if by any human possibility the other could have heard what he did then geoffrey bent forward a little in the preliminary effort to get to his feet but instead of rising he reached out suddenly and caught my arm and pointed with it there in the wet clay right at our feet was the single print of a woman's shoe it was pointed toward us geoffrey straightened up and turned around and i followed him look he said a big rock was bedded in the hillside we had just come tumbling down it projected out in a great ledge and underneath it shrinking back into the dark of the little cave it formed i saw well irene fournier's face the face i had seen glowing with colour on geoffrey's canvas the face i had seen dozens of times in crude newspaper half-tones as they had photographed her in the morgue the face of the girl in the ice it was as white now as it must have been then with a kind of dreadful bluish pallor and the golden hair as it went back into the shadows was wildly dishevelled and dripping wet but the eyes shone there out of the dark luminous like those of a hunted animal that was the face barton had seen last night i should have fled as barton did if the paralysis of nightmare hadn't held me still i'd have cried out with horror of the thing but my throat was numb for the girl was dead dead and yet we saw her there it was from those blue lips that that wailing cry had come with an effort i got my eyes away from her and looked at geoffrey he looked a little limp and he was very pale but what he said was thank god we're in time i was afraid we'd be too late he didn't say it to me but to that dreadful apparition in the cave you're quite safe now he added and then he moved gently toward her End of chapter 19